Yeah, crazy boys did it. We got 10k likes on my how historically accurate is 1444 start date video. And as such, we're gonna cover in depth the Balkan region today. How historical it is, what's the background for this entire region, and why it is the way it is. If we get 10,000 likes on this video, I'm also gonna cover the Germanic area. And that's gonna be a really juicy area to learn more about. And if you enjoy the content, consider subscribing. It would encourage me to make more videos like these in the future and it will notify you whenever I release new videos. As you guys probably know, the game starts on the 11th of November 1444, which is exactly one day after the famous Battle of Varna, which took place in Varna, Bulgaria, roughly around this area over here. And that was essentially a conflict, a part of a larger scheme of conflicts. When you think about warfare in the Middle Ages, don't really think about it as it started on this particular date and it ended on this particular date date. That is something that came up a little bit later down the line, especially when it comes to Balkan conflict. In the early to late Middle Ages, pretty much they had very open-ended beginnings and closures. What do I mean by this? On August of 1444, that is a few months before the start date, the Crusaders actually signed a peace treaty with the Ottomans called the Peace of Zeget. In that peace treaty, the Ottomans actually lost the war, technically. They were forced to pay 100,000 florins to the Crusaders. They also released the nation of Serbia and recognized them as an independent state as well as they renounced all claims on Albanian land and acknowledged the Albanian state. Prior to August 1444, the Serbians were a vassal state of the Ottomans and the Albanians were basically a loose confederation of rebellions led by Skanderbeg. Skanderbeg, by the way, used to be a general in the Ottoman army of Albanian origins. He even faked for about 20 years or so the fact that he was a uh, Muslim, he was in fact trying to avoid suspicions of, from the Ottomans. There are actually a lot of conflicting uh, records on this. Some say that he became rebellious after certain events. Some say that he was planning it for a while. Who knows? Nobody can obviously know this for sure, especially since we have so little record on the matter. But in November 1444, it's literally one day after the Crusader army was defeated at the Battle of Varna. And because of that, there should not be a peace between Hungary, Poland, Poland, Wallachia, and so on, and the Ottomans. Officially, there was no peace treaty, and in 48, which is four years afterwards, the Ottomans defeated the Hungarians again at the Second Battle of Kosovo, and after that event, basically, they signed the proper peace deal. Now, the thing is, in August of 1444, they did sign the peace treaty I mentioned before, the Peace of Zeged. According to that peace treaty, they had 10 years of truce, not five, so if that's the case, then you want to have truce with uh, the Serbians, Hungarians, and so on until 54, not until 49. The same goes for Karaman, actually, until 54, not 49. But the reality is, but the reality is that despite the peace treaty being signed, the Crusaders still advanced and still fought the Ottomans at the Battle of Varna. So from a political perspective, it's a weird situation, as even afterwards, four years later after the peace treaty was technically signed in Kosovo, they had another battle that we know of. Similarly, the Karamani in 1444, despite having signed as well a peace treaty with the Ottomans, they did declare another campaign against the Ottomans, took back a lot of their lands, and even some other smaller Beyliks in Anatolia tried to take some lands from the Ottomans, which is why Murat II actually came back to active service. He, in fact, wanted to let his son, Mehmet the Conqueror, as we know him today, in charge, and he wanted to have a bit of a retirement. After those events, he again let his son be in charge of the empire and he did eventually go on his uh, long deserved vacation right now that we got that out of the way so we actually understand what's happening at the start of the game and why the game starts in 1444 why this played out such a major role in history and essentially the reason why the game starts in 1444 by the way i have to mention a few things first off the ottomans would not have 30,000 soldiers available just like that willy-nilly they had massive issues with manpower after the battle of varna they actually lost a huge Huge amount of troops at the Battle of Varna. They won the battle, but they still lost a massive amount of troops. And the Ottomans had issues with the loyalty of the Rumeli troops. And Mehmed always struggled with the loyalty of his troops. Technically, he didn't have any rebellions because he knew how to keep them in check. But I like to see that actually shown in the game somehow. Maybe like a triggered event or maybe a disaster that you have to avoid or something of the sorts. That would be pretty interesting. Similarly, the uh, leader of Serbia, Mr. Durad Branko, 
Yankovic only took charge of the nation literally a few months before the game start in 43 I believe 44 I can't really remember exactly when but he wouldn't have such a consolidated grasp over the land and there would actually be different nobles in parts of Serbia that would still have conflicting loyalties and by the way after the battle of uh, Kosovo the second battle of Kosovo the Serbians actually captured Janos Hunyadi later on released him but they captured him after the battle when he was retreating back towards Hungary and I'd like to see that also played in because if they decided to execute Hunyadi history would be extremely different for all of us today maybe I'd be speaking Turkish you never know since at the end of the day Hungarians were one of the main reasons why the Ottomans did not just raffle stomp everybody in the Balkans early on in uh, 1444 so from a political map perspective Constantinople should definitely have the entire coastline of Kirklisi here also these islands in the north would be a part of Byzantium too to be extremely precise the islands of Thassos and Samothraki would be a part of Genoa this is true but the islands of uh, Limnos, Kalekoi and another one here Boscada would be a part of Byzantium not of Genoa and I understand that uh, adding one more province in these three islands would be a bit too much and it would be way too many provinces here so from that perspective it makes 100% sense that the paradox didn't add just a thousand different provinces to ensure 100% historical accuracy it wouldn't even be feasible let's face it my personal biggest issue with this area is the fact that if they decide to make the south tip of uh, Greece fully a part of Byzantium then they should do the same with Athens because both Athens and the despot of Morea were actually vassals of the Byzantines as the empire was quite decentralized in 1444 compared to the massively centralized Roman Eastern Roman Empire that we know of from before right they were basically on their last lengths guys they barely were still hanging in there and the siege of Constantinople in 1453 was massively to be expected there was no chance they would survive the only chance they had was the crusade that the uh, Europeans tried to use to uh, establish a free independent Bulgarian nation and push the Ottomans a little bit out of the Balkans and of course because that failed history is what it is today I have right here a map of the 1444 start date and we're going to be focusing on the Balkans there are some inaccuracies with this map but overall this is the best map I found on the internet that shows the 1444 start date as you can see the uh, coastline here of uh, the Byzantine lands are way bigger than we see it personally in uh, the EU4 map and you can also see the island with the despot of Morea and Athens being quite a little bit more decentralized whenever you see something with the outlines of the country but the inside is a little bit differently colored that means this area had a lot more autonomy or it was a vassal or anything of the sort it's basically depicting that it's not as centralized that's why for example in the Ottoman lands you have everything pretty centralized not anything separate you do have the different flags for the different regions but they're all ruled from one place in Edirne at the time the capital of the Ottoman Empire you can also see the small rebellious independent citadel of Bulgarians here that uh, was pretty short-lived. They eventually succumbed to the Ottomans once they sieged them down after the whole crusades happened. This is Varna, the place of the famous Battle of Varna. And a much better and more accurate depiction of uh, the nations of Moldova, Wallachia, and Transylvania. By comparison, in EU4, you can definitely tell that Moldova especially is not really well depicted, with Transylvania being shown as a 100% integrated into Hungary which is really not the case at the time Transylvania had a semi-independent status it was ruled by a Hungarian nobility and from the Hungarian court but they did have a huge amount of autonomy and they decided a lot of their own laws all they did have to do is provide the soldiers and a part of their income to the Hungarian crown which was normal that was basically what vassalage meant at the time I've also mentioned before that in the Middle Ages you could actually be a vassal of more than just one nation you could be paying tribute to one nation and be a vassal of another you could be a PU of a nation and a vassal of another it was much more complicated than we actually see it in EU4 for that matter for example Wallachia in 444 was independent but it was actually paying a tribute to the crown of Hungary and another tribute to the Ottoman port so it is virtually impossible to show that obviously but it would be interesting to see a feature of the sorts added maybe in EU5 whenever that's gonna come out Hint hint guys come on add it in u5 please <laughs> moldova at the same time should have the northern parts here and the area should be a little bit better defined yash for example would not have this whole chunk across the uh, perth river it would basically have this area with the other 
side being separately managed from uh, whatever city was on this side. I know one of the biggest cities here was at one point the capital of Moldova. Take a good look at what this looks like in U4. And now look at how it looks on this map. Way better depicted. You can see the various city-states around here. You have Ragusa. But remember that Venice at this point was actually a sort of a confederation of trading cities. That's why a lot of these cities, despite directly being owned by Venice, had a lot of self-determination. And once more, if Naxos is shown as a vassal, Negropon, Cephalonia, Candia, and so on should be shown as vassals also, or just integrate Naxos to make it fair. Montenegro also exists in the small province of uh, Zeta. There was quite a few more Bosnian entities in this area. Croatia was not as big as shown in EU4, and there was a separate duchy of Slavonia right next to the Croatia kingdom that owned parts of uh, the Croatian land as we know it today. Telia was significantly better and for that matter there was a lot of famous battles between Janos Hunyadi, the regent of Hungary and the famous Baron of Telia, Ulrich von Telia or whatever his name was. I think it's Ulrich von Telia though. He did own a lot of land. This was also Telia, this was also Telia and he got his ass kicked by the Austrian Habsburgs but in 1444 he did have a significantly higher influence influence over the region rather than how you see it in EU4. I mean, by comparison, in EU4, it's literally just a small little province that's easy to get annexed, right? And speaking of, the Habsburgs were divided into multiple branches with the main branch in the proper Vienna area here, having the other branches under a personal union, essentially. But Tyrol owned all of these areas here, and Styria also owned a few here. Albeit, in that map that I'm showing you guys, it's not 100% accurate. From what I've read, Staymark and Graz was a part of the proper Habsburg crown by this point, with uh, Styria owning a mixture of lands together with Telia in this main area. Culturally speaking, the map is extremely wrong, I have to say, probably one of the most disappointing things. I understand why they did it for a lot of balance purposes, um, and I think to appease certain nations as well, but the reality is, pretty much the entire coastline of the Anatolian parts would be Greek, it would not be Turkish, far from that. There would be Cappadocians in the this particular area there would be Armenians in this area a lot more Kurds in Malatia there would be more Pontic Greeks in the Canic Sinop area and even some more Greeks by the Kutakia Denizli parts the central part of Anatolia would be very very Turkic that is true but the coastline in 1444 far from that there's multiple records of this and I am assuming this was just a political move why they did it's not my place to say why but that's just my personal opinion and because I know some of you will think that I'm just buying biased and oh really it was all Turkish all along no that's not true there's actual multiple books on this issue and I'm gonna show you one of these books for example this one is the Turkish colonization of Anatolia by WC Bryce which is a lecturer in the University of Manchester in the first paragraph you can pause if you want and read it the whole thing essentially what it says is that the uh, Turkish Muslims moved into the central part of Anatolia and despite the rapid establishment of Islam and the Turkish language in the center there is is no evidence or documents of the extermination of the vanquished people. Instead, what happened is in the central part, and you can see the more you read into this, that the majority of the people in the central part of uh, Anatolia were in fact not 100% on board with orthodoxy. They had their own pagan faith still and different versions of Christianity because the Greek language and the Greek customs did not 100% penetrate the central part of Anatolia as Greek was predominantly a city language and a city ethnicity, let's say. Of course, still, there was mostly Greek villages in the central part before the Turks arrived, but they did have different customs and it was easier for the Turks to convert them to Islam and to mix with them, not kill them off, but mix with them. That's why most Turkish people are surprised to find Greek DNA in their DNA today. And it was a slow process. There's other books that show throughout the ages in the 13, 14, 15, 16th century how the entirety of the coastline was still predominantly Greek. The moment when this all changed was in the 20th century when, of course, as you know, there were some cultural conversions of certain ethnicities. And I also want to mention that at the start, the Ottoman Empire was one of the most tolerant empires in the world in the high Middle Ages and early Renaissance it was way more tolerant than most Western nations were. 
were and the reason why so many Greeks and other ethnicities were happy to be a part of the empire is because the early Ottoman Empire had a very meritocracy sort of system similar to the Mongolian system, albeit not exactly the same, that really helped it expand really easily and helped lower the amount of unrest as you would have it shown in U4. Obviously Albanian would not be a part of the South Slavic group, it would maybe be a part of the Byzantine group let's say, because they did have a lot of resemblance and a lot of things in common with the Greeks and the Byzantines, way more than with the Slavs or alternatively if you want to go full historical but that would not be very balanced, just make them a separate group as they have a completely different language and even completely different customs. The coastline obviously would be Dalmatian majority and Bosniak as a culture and a different culture compared to Serbian and Croatian is debatable. I would say Bosniak as a separate ethnic group would come to be after the Ottoman uh, Empire decided to convert the, these people to uh, Islam. Prior to that there was a Bosnian nation, that is true, but the Bosnian nation was a Catholic Serbian speaking nation because all of these tribes here that you see, Croatian, Slovenian, Serbian and so on, would technically be one people when they first arrived, when they migrated to this area. Eventually they split into two people, three people, four and more based off of first off religion, the western part adopting Catholicism, the eastern part sticking with the orthodoxy and then again because of religion the Bosnians also broke apart and uh, became their own separate ethnic group I guess. I have to say that Uskup would be a hundred percent Bulgarian not Serbian and Ohri would be a mixture of Bulgarian with Serbs and with Albanian but I'd say probably predominant Bulgarian so these two if anything you should basically put them as Bulgarian provinces rather than Serbian provinces in uh, 1444 and Tolku would be a lot more mixed I wouldn't put it as Bulgarian I wouldn't even put it as Romanian I have no idea it would have to be a completely different culture here because from what I've seen map wise and from historical records it was always a mixture between Romanians Bulgarians Turks Ukrainians so many different it was extremely multicultural and multi-ethnic this area with various uh, ethnicities occupying various parts of this uh, province throughout the ages on that same note I would not make Transylvanian a separate culture I would make this Romanian with Hungarian or Italy in the Maros area and parts of the Temes area at the start date. Maramures however would be definitely Romanian. There was never so much uh, of a majority Ruthenian in these parts. Similarly half of Halix would be Romanian rather than uh, the whole thing being Ruthenian. Oh but Ludi you're only saying this because you are Romanian. Maybe, maybe. Maybe I'm a little bit biased. I'm just saying what I've read from historical books but the reality is we'll never know what the truth is. To make a bit of a side note, a roughly 400 years before the start date in the 11th century, the Battle of Manzikert which occurred around this area here, now it's called Malazgurt apparently, I guess that's the uh, Turkish version? Yep, that's the Turkish version. Is the reason why Turkey exists today and why the Turkic people migrated into Anatolia. They were obviously running away from the Asian parts and they were migrating in these parts. They won the Battle of Manzikert against the Byzantines and that secured their entrance into Anatolia. They started first with small tribes to settle in the central parts, working their way into this part and then they became mercenaries for the Byzantines, the Byzantines using them in their various battles around the 11th century. But by doing so, they also granted them lands and let them settle deeper and deeper into the empire and eventually that backfired because obviously they took over the majority of the Anatolian parts. The Seljuks eventually broke apart and that gave way to the uh, Osman family, well Osman's tribe or whatever it's called, that eventually became the empire of the Ottomans with Osman being the first of his name to rule the uh, Ottomans. And he had his origins in these parts, eventually conquering the entirety of uh, the northwest of Anatolia and then slowly conquering the rest of the Beyliks and taking advantage of the uh, Venetians at one point which granted the Ottomans access to Gelibolu, the entrance point into Europe and probably the biggest mistake the Venetians ever made. Also want to mention that if you look at Istanbul right now, this right here is what the historical city was. This is how big it was. It was very small compared to the entirety of Istanbul which is a massive right now. Okay, it also had the Galata area so let's say it was like this big, altogether this big and look at how massive it is today. It's basically 10 times the size compared to back then. Another thing I want to mention is the fact that you see the provinces of Sedem and uh, Belgrade over here being a part of Hungary. This actually happened a few months prior to our start date when uh, Mr. Durad Brand 
Frankovic actually sold these lands or promised these lands to the Hungarians in return for their help. And the truth is that 1443 to 1444, so many political things happened, so many changing of sides for the Serbians. Either they're with the Hungarians, either they're with the Turks, then backstabbed, then restabbed, and oh my freaking lord, what the schnapps happened here, man. Durad Brankovic really didn't know what was the best option for him, which side to go for, and that basically cost Serbia its independence a few years later down the line. A few years after the start date also is when Vlad Dracula, as you guys might know him, or Vlad the Impaler as we know him, became the leader of uh, Valachia. At the start date, we have Vlad the Second Draculesh, which is the dad of Dracula. This guy over here, he had to give away two of his sons, Radu and Vlad, the one that would eventually become the famous Dracula, as Yanniseries to the court of the Ottomans. It was basically tradition for this to happen to ensure that uh, they obey whatever the Ottoman port asked them to do and they don't revolt. If they did revolt, they would get executed. And Vlad Dracula was actually a friend of Mehmed the Conqueror. They grew up together, in fact. And when you think about it, it's actually quite amazing that two very unique and interesting historical figures from very different backgrounds were probably friends at one. Vlad's brother, namely uh, Radu, actually was at the siege of Constantinople in 1453 alongside Mehmed because he was a vassal of uh, the Ottomans. And in 1453, Valachia became a vassal state under the leadership of Radu when the Ottomans installed Radu and managed to kick out Dracula for a while from uh, Valachia. He would eventually come back. Dracula actually ruled three times in Valachia up until 1476, if I remember correctly. I really hope you guys enjoyed my storytelling here. I had fun making this video and I hope to make a video for the Holy Roman Empire. So if we get 10,000 likes, I would be more than happy to make that video. Also, consider subscribing if you enjoyed the video. It probably means you enjoy in general my channel, right? Right? So why not subscribe and encourage me to make more videos? Also, if you enjoy Portugal, check out my awesome Portuguese video right here. And I want to give a very big thank you to all of my channel members, Patreon members, as well as my Twitch supporters. I really wouldn't be able to do this without all of your support. You guys are absolutely amazing.